Well, hello everybody and welcome to uh, another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, this one is about the CoreOS integration strategy. I think it's a very timely conversation and one a lot of people have been asking me about. So I've gotten Jeff and Ben to come on um, to give us an update on the progress and the road ahead. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time introducing them or talking about them. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and get right into the meat of the thing. As usual, we will do chat um, Q&A and then live Q&A at the end. So um, please, Jeff and Ben, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Hey guys, so my name is Ben Briard. I am on the product management team here at Red Hat. Uh, I kind of work with a lot of different technologies that are kind of uh, like, think of them as like low level enablements on both the Linux side, uh, container runtimes, and you know, things like system D, uh, and then how we make that into a useful container host. So, um, you know, moving forward, just really focusing on everything we're doing around Red Hat Core OS. Um, so, yeah, that's me. I kind of sit in between uh, the RHEL and OpenShift uh, sides of the house here at Red Hat. Jeff, I'll pass it to you. Hey, uh, I'm Jeff Ligon. Um, I'm also in a little bit of a between two world situation where uh, I've got some engineers that work with me to uh, help the platform side of the house as well as the OpenShift side of the house. And um, a lot of that comes together in some of the work we're gonna talk about today. And uh, a lot of it is uh, going to meetings to both sides of the organizations and uh, making sure that both sides are getting everything that they need. And uh, try and keep everybody happy, which is a fun little juggling act. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, yeah, so thank you everybody for joining. Uh, today's uh, presentation is really gonna be geared towards um, like the, the operating system side of the house. So uh, we, we will get into some higher higher level primitives, but um, we are going to, to talk mostly about, you know, kind of what we're doing uh, moving forward at the kind of what we're calling the immutable host layer of the stack. Um, I, I want to kind of give a little bit of context for, uh, for the presentation today. Just uh, when we say core OS, I want to make sure that we're all kind of speaking the same language and using the terms in the same way so that, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking in circles here, uh, but just a, a really brief look at, at what CoreOS uh, offered. So obviously Tectonic was the, the flagship from CoreOS, which is the you know, full blown Kubernetes uh, platform, uh, which they did a, a phenomenal job on the actual you know, provisioning and instantiating the cluster. And then all these concepts around day two management with things like operators and and things like that is a really robust platform. Um, everybody on this call, hopefully by this point, knows that um, there's you know there's a lot of commonalities there with OpenShift, obviously both being Kubernetes offerings that um, we're really we're we're basically combining the two, right? So we're getting we're gaining uh, all of these cool capabilities that Tectonic brings on like the the operation side of the house uh, to OpenShift. Whereas OpenShift has always had this great developer story for onboarding applications. Um, now we we were just really excited about about everything that kind of Tectonic brings to that story to round it out. Um, uh, now the next one, so CoreOS Container Linux um, is the the operating system. Uh, it was originally called CoreOS, and a fun story, I don't know if anybody here uh, knows this or not, but uh, the, the the kind of the way this got started is uh, Kai and Leonard, two, uh, two longtime Red Hatters, uh, gave a talk at a plumber's conference in, I don't know, 2012 maybe, um, about this concept of the core OS, and it was a basically a system D talk. And, and at the end of that talk, Alex came up and said, Hey, where can I download uh, the core OS? And they said, well, it's a concept. It doesn't really exist. And he's like, well, I'm going to go build the core OS. Um, so I, I think that's a, that's a great, uh, a great story. And so I, you know, obviously being a fan of all the technology in the space, it's, it's cool to kind of see that core OS uh, name kind of come back around home to Red Hat. Um, so it, Anyway, the, the OS, CoreOS, was rebranded a couple years ago as Container Linux. So, you know, throughout this talk, if we say Container Linux, we're talking about, um, you know, that version of the operating system that kind of grew out of Chrome OS. Um, 
and where, where we're going forward with this is that that name didn't really seem to catch on with all the user base. A lot of people still call it CoreOS. So moving forward, um, we're going to be calling it like Red Hat CoreOS. So we'll we'll get into clarifying all that stuff here in a minute. But I just want to make sure everybody's kind of level set there on container Linux. Um, and then obviously CoreOS had a really really great registry uh, way, and, and really nothing changes there. That um, that continues on as a separate. Dachin, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold your question. That's a good question. I'm gonna hold that to the end. But yeah, I guess while I'm thinking about it, anybody just go ahead and throw questions into the chat, and we'll we, Jeff and I will hit those here at the end. All right. Um, okay. So framing container Linux, right? The whole idea behind this is we want just enough operating system. Give me just enough Linux um, user space to boot the system. I need a I need a kernel. I need basic capabilities like networking, I need SSH, I need a container runtime, maybe two, uh, but I, I really want ju like just tiny operating system that is purpose built so I can just stick everything in containers, right? Um, this was a very similar path that we were on uh, with Atomic as well, uh, but container Linux, you know, that epoch fired off, I think that was summer of 2013, um, and it's been a super successful uh, distribution Kudos to those guys. We, we've always really, really liked this vision at Red Hat. Um, I stole a few slides from Brandon Phillips. He and I did a talk at the summit, so I definitely want to give him credit for the, the next uh, three or four slides here. Um, we kind of went a little more in depth on the retrospective looking back at the technology. I'm going to make a couple of those same points here just so everybody kind of has some context for uh, what we're doing moving forward. Um, but so one of the premises of container Linux is that um, just the, the basic fundamentals of containers, once we put all of our application dependencies and apps bundled in that image of the container, uh, we basically, we've, we've separated uh, that from the app or from the underlying operating system. And with that separation, um, the, the result is we can just then automate updates uh, for the system. And this is this is very true and proved out, um, you know, quite effective uh, with, with the user base. Um, even people with, you know, like OpenShift or just RHEL systems and, and everything else have, have experienced the, the, you know, the ease of upgrading the underlying OS from the actual containers themselves. Now, um, a couple other things on the premise. So container Linux, uh, as it evolved, kind of got to this like simple architecture, this, uh, this kind of simple layered cake, if you will, of, of uh, all these uh, kind of latest bits, right? So you'd have a, a really, uh, a new kernel, um, a new system D, uh, you know, a pretty new Docker engine and, and Kubla, right? And then the the theory was that all of these will kind of have fairly clean, reasonable separation and interact well with each other. Again, this is Brandon's slide. I really, it's it's funny and sad. <laughs> I, think, I think all of us have felt uh, that tension between um, features and stability in environments. And I think in a lot of times, uh, we all we all want both, right? I want the latest cool stuff, and I want stability. Um, and I, I think to a, to a high degree, uh, they were able to to achieve that, but <laughs> it, it it really manifested in different ways. Like, uh, unfortunately, with that layered cake model, really just the kernel API was the only thing that was actually like proved stable and can can really you know run very old legacy apps on a on a on a brand new modern Linux kernel. Um, and so there was obviously challenges here. Um, the the other area I want to call out that and the and the reason I'm calling this out is just so you guys know why we're why we're gonna turn some knobs here in a second. Um, was that at the tectonic side, um, the transactional updates were really, really, really good on the host. However, they weren't necessarily driven from the cluster and pushed down to all nodes, right? And so, uh, you know, what we've heard from, you know, some of the Tectonic customers, or really just anybody doing Kubernetes on container Linux, is that when a host reboots, sometimes you don't necessarily know what version it's gonna go, gonna boot into. And it's it's one of the things where 
accusers say that it, you know it, it's it's hard to, to have consistency that way between the the two boot partitions um, using container Linux. Um, and so this is something that we we really wanted to to improve uh, that consistency at at the cluster level. Um, now, when we look at the ecosystem side and kind of how this has evolved um, over the past you know, four plus years, right? It's grown a lot. This is a graphic from the CNCF um, website. I think it's good. All right, I, if if I was drawing this, the Kubernetes logo, which is kind of hidden here on the left side, would be about eight times bigger. Um, but anyway, uh, it still makes the point. And it, you know, with the with the ecosystem that's growing this this fast, with so many so many projects uh, working at so many different levels and layers of the stack, right? Um, I think I think a lot of people have this. Um, they kind of see this, and and it almost has a, a, that sushi menu effect of oh, I want this, I want that, I want this. I'm going to run from here. Now I have my dream stack, and I'm ready to go. And uh, and that's that's challenging, right? We we have 11 releases of OpenShift under our belts, and I think the reality is is you can make a lot of these pieces pluggable, um, but it's it's really really hard to do and and I think the the reality and and the realization like we've come to is that while <laughs> we want to believe that a lot of these layers are are loosely coupled, the, the reality is they're actually pretty darn tightly coupled, right? Um, yes, there are API interfaces that define a lot of these uh, interfaces, but um, especially when you get into low level plumbing in the stack, um, you know containers can update independently of the OS, but separating the OS from platforms is actually a, a whole nother thing that, that adds, it's far more complicated. All right, and so with that as a backdrop, um, I'm gonna kick it over to Jeff on the next few slides. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so as Ben was saying, um, the, the realization that we really need to um, come to a better understanding of what the platform needs from the OS and how the OS can serve the platform. Uh, we're, we're trying to take the things that CoreOS learned in Container Linux and the things that Red Hat learned in Project Atomic and bring them forward to uh, a little bit of a new space where um, we are trying to integrate what OpenShift needs with the operating system, right? So um, we've, we've got the great stability of the rail kernel and the backing of the support organization of Red Hat that can really be delivered in a little bit more of an automated and uh, controlled fashion that uh, really preserves the philosophy of container Linux while uh, giving our customers the best of what we've been delivering for years, right? And uh, next slide. Ben, are you driving the uh, presentation? Awesome. Yeah. So uh, what, what we've really got going on now is we've really uh, laid out exactly what we want to deliver as a subset of uh, real content and uh, the kernel and firmware support and system D and glibc and uh, combine that with the version of Kubernetes that uh, OpenShift is delivering with um, the latest releases and the latest cryo that matches that in the Red Hat Core OS product that we're shipping just for OpenShift. And the entire purpose of this host is to run OpenShift well and to run your containers well, right? And we've split that off into a community version of Fedora Core OS, which is built on uh, the Fedora content that matches the same kind of uh, cycle that's currently existing out in the community. So um, Red Hat Core OS is tied to exactly what OpenShift wants and needs for that version going out the door, and that version matches what's in the OS and what's all the way up the stack. And Fedora Core OS is a little bit more of a generic container runtime where you could have a little bit more choice about what you want to run and uh, the, the choices that you're going to make, right? And uh, next slide. 
And the way that we reached what those decisions were was we took a look at a lot of the overlapping technologies that we were all working on and we we tried to make good valuable decisions that are going to make everybody's life easier and keep as many people happy as we can and of course we can't make everybody happy and we know that but uh we want to make sure that we're improving the uh, quality of the things that we're putting out into the community as well as making our lives easier and uh, sysadmins' lives easier running this stuff, right? So um, we, we really wanted to lean into the operator framework and make sure that we've got this uh, model where going forward, we're delivering the operators that are gonna be able to help run the cluster and help drive the cluster to remain healthy. And the, the work that CoreOS was doing on the operator framework was just like a no-brainer, easy to pick as, you know, this is the wave of the future and we, we've really got to embrace it. Um, sticking with uh, etcd um, for what we're doing in the uh, storage under underpinnings and um, super tied to what we're doing in Kubernetes, right? And container network uh, CNI work is critical for everything we're doing with our version of the OCI tools that we make. And uh, Ignition is just this really great way of thinking about how to configure nodes to do exactly what we need and to deliver the exact settings that we want to have in the nodes that we're running. Um, toolbox. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the, the great tools that they had been delivering with Toolbox were available to uh, what we're going to be doing in the future and make sure that uh, that kind of ease of use is just there from the beginning. Um, some of the stuff that that uh, made a little bit of room for on the right-hand side is the stuff that we're no longer considering as important to our strategic direction, but we still know that the community cares about um, and we don't want to just you know become the big bad red hat and just kill or anything we want to make sure that we're treating it responsibly and uh, acting nicely for the community so uh, rocket is continuing to be a cncf project um, and we're, we're trying to make sure that the people that want to use it continue to use it and uh, not do anything drastic uh, fleet uh, we're deprecating and um, that's been the kind of model for the proper way of saying, hey, this is something we don't see a lot of future for, so we wanna make sure that we get announcements out early and we give plenty of warning. And even with plenty of warning, sometimes people wind up surprised. And so we try and make sure that uh, we're having good, honest conversations about it. Um, Locksmith, uh, we're, as it says, we're moving the coordination to operators and running this a little bit more as a Kubernetes model, letting the cluster kind of drive it. And um, we're, we're trying to provide alternatives in Fedora Core OS for uh, non-Kubernetes environments as well, because we thought it was a great idea. We, we don't want to, you know, get rid of it. It's just a matter of what should really own the cluster and what should really own the nodes on the cluster. Um, Matchbox continues to be a community project for uh, Pixie and Ignition configs, um, but we don't really have many plans for things that we're going to be doing with it. The same with Torx. Um, we're, we're not really keeping the uh, update model that we had with Container Linux, um, so they're, it's just not as relevant, but we're certainly not uh, getting rid of it by any means. Um, and Flannel, again, maintenance only. Um, we have us moving to OBS and OVN, right? Uh, next slide. So the way that we really wanted to bring this together is to make sure that uh, the node is a little bit more managed by what the cluster needs at that time, right? And the way that we're really trying to deliver that is to make sure that we've got uh, the, the known kernel system D and SE Linux that you get from just a, a regular rel host and add in exactly the version of the kubelet and the runtime and ignition that you need to do the things that a Kubernetes cluster wants. And so um, we want to make sure that that kind of uh, full set of things is there for the exact version of OpenShift that you're going to be running. And so we've aligned exactly what goes into each version of the OS or what OpenShift wants, right? 
and uh, we're, we're going to be releasing at the same cadence as OpenShift to make sure that uh, everything goes out the door at the same time. And this is the best uh, automated delivery mechanism for making sure that our, our OS is really running what OpenShift needs at the time. Um, we want to kind of maintain some of the great things that came about from Container Linux uh, with the user experience and uh, just trying to make it the minimal host possible and totally integrated with what the higher levels need. And we want to deliver automated updates and CVE remediation through uh, the automated update model that we're, we're kind of driving with uh, the stream of updates that we're going to be delivering to the cluster. Um, we're keeping Ignition because it's just an amazing technology that does a lot of really good stuff and uh, really just sets the tone for how we're going to um, get nodes up and running, right? Um, and this is going to be fully supporting the RHEL ABI and the ecosystem. So if it runs on RHEL, it's going to run on Red Hat Core OS and container, right? Uh, next slide. So some of the things that we're doing differently, um, we're dropping Cloud init in favor of Ignition. Um, so we, we know that there's a lot of tooling already kind of around that. And so we're, we're trying to be mindful of how we're going to get everything uh, going correctly with Ignition and uh, make sure that everybody knows that this is kind of the direction we're going. Um, the Kubernetes master and node components are, as we said, moving on to the host. Um, the beta that we're planning will be AWS only, and um, other clouds and on-prem are going to be soon after that. Um, we're talking about bare metal, but uh, if if somebody wants something custom for some storage drivers or something strange, then that may require just sticking with vanilla rel and doing a bring your own host kind of setup, which we're going to try and support. Um, we're moving away from the big monolithic updates for the entire uh, uh, cluster so that you won't be updating the OS of the nodes separately from updating the cluster itself. And we're going to let the cluster drive that and be uh, in control of when nodes are being upgraded and what they're being upgraded to. And uh, we've got this great mechanism for doing that with RPM OS tree where uh, it pulls down a, qu a container, it boots up the container, pulls down the updates that it needs to the node, and then reboots. And um, if everything goes smoothly and everything comes up and it rejoins the cluster, then great. And if it doesn't, then uh, we've got some rollback protection with RPM OS tree where it will roll back automatically and try and rejoin the cluster and uh, make sure that the cluster knows what's going on with that node. Right. Next slide. So the transactional updates that uh, used to happen in um, Container Linux were more along the lines of an AB partition switch where they would download a new image to the other partition and then reboot and hope that it comes up and rejoins. Uh, for what we've got with RPM OS tree, we're using uh, what we feel is a little bit better of a mechanism for delivering those updates. Um, RPM OS tree has always had the ability to be in the middle of an update and you could just pull the power on that node and it wouldn't completely just destroy the node. You could update in the old, uh, update in the old um, version of the OS that was running and roll back and uh, try and do the update again. Hold on just a sec. Like, well, while Jeff's muted, I'll just pop in here for a second. So we, when looking at uh, how both Container Linux and Atomic Host uh, handle update or update, excuse me, the, the transactional side um, is actually one of the biggest successes of these of these hosts, right? Um, the, you know, one of the things on like a, on, a, on an RPM driven system, obviously it's incredibly robust, um, That that's all good. But what's so neat about this is you you pull the updates in the background, right? So it never there there is never a point on the system where you're in transaction. So there's never a runtime change of the bits, right? So really, we bring all of that immutability of the of of what we experience for containers, right? 
um, we bring that down to the host operating system. So this is one of the biggest successes of this model and, and absolutely something we, we're going to be carrying forward. Um, yeah, Jeff, if you're back, let me know. Yeah. Sorry about that. Cool. Uh, I, I, I've got my kids today because the hurricane uh, dropped us out of school. My apologies. But um, yeah, everything's fine. Uh -huh. Just wanted some help with the TV or something and I just couldn't break away. Uh, so yeah, back to um, RPM OS tree. Um, we, we've got some great technology that we've been working on for years. We've got a lot of great use cases and we've been, uh, we've been really working hard on making sure that it can fit the model that we want and uh, the, letting the cluster drive that kind of solves the familiarity problems that we kind of were having with Atomic where we know that, um, sorry, now I've got an emergency alert. <laughs> uh, it, everything's fine. Um, so uh, we, we've been working with making sure that the cluster will be able to pull down the exact image of the uh, next version of the operating system that it needs. Uh, move to those updates and then restart and have some control over whether when, when something goes wrong, what we can go back to, not just one version, but multiple versions if they still exist on the system, right? So we're not uh, kind of stuck in the model of if we have a bad update and then we try and roll onto another one and that fails too, then that node is just kind of hosed, right? We've got multiple options and the cluster can kind of manage that and we'll be able to pick up that data and kind of know where to go in cases of uh, things not working correctly. Uh, next slide. So uh, Ignition uses uh, config transpilers to take a look at what it needs and how to resolve it and uh, kind of make sure that um, the node has the permissions, uh, SSH keys, and all the things that are going to be needed to join the cluster as well as run the things that the cluster needs from it and to really make sure that um, it's done in an upstream manner. We're, we're working with the machine config specs and uh, we're, we're really driving this uh, with the upstream version of where things are going. Um, next slide over the air updates. Uh, we we really want the cluster to be able to know when it's time to upgrade that we can move to the next version of uh, Kubernetes or even a, a minor or major bump and just have that ability to have that one button push and everything just rolls out and everything succeeds and provide a little bit of stability and security on the side of knowing that we've done it in advance internally before it gets out and uh, that everything is going to go really seamlessly. Um, this one this one button push update is really our mindset for how to improve the upgrade process because we know that you know that's one of the common complaints about is about the complexity of getting an entire cluster to upgrade easily. Uh, it it just doesn't exist today, right? So we're we're building the future and trying to provide the certainty and uh, support that is going to get us there. Uh, next slide. And one of the ways that we're trying to make sure that this uh, remains um, a useful project to the community is we're trying to provide uh, lots of options and lots of um, ability to customize over on the Fedora side of things so that uh, other developers can come and build other things from Fedora Core OS and not just be limited to uh, matching exactly what they what Upstream Cube wants to do or Upstream Mesos wants to do or whatever somebody wants to run, right? We're going to provide lots of options and uh, provide the same kind of uh, update stream that Container Linux has been doing for years and provide it in a way that uh, makes it easily consumable by people that want to experiment, people that want to actually develop, people that want to actually run things on a community-supported uh, version of things, right? Um, and that's at the cluster level as well as the single host level. Um, we're going to try and keep it up to date with the latest stable kernel from the Always Ready Kernel CI that's already out in Fedora. And uh, we're going to have an over-the-air update mechanism uh, along the same lines of what's going on with OpenShift uh, via Cincinnati. And uh, it's going to have the same delivery mechanism where we have a container image that's out there. The host will pull that container image down 
pull the updates out of that container image and then uh, do the reboot. And if things don't work, it'll roll back, right? Uh, we're going to feature Podman, uh, Moby, Docker, uh, Inspawn, and pretty much anything else that somebody wants to put on there. We've, we've got a mechanism for uh, getting feedback from the community, and anybody can always just come and ask us. And um, next slide. Uh, we've got a lot more technical information that is always constantly being updated. Um, we've got talks that Colin and Benjamin and Dusty have done in the past and will be doing again in the future. Um, and we've got the Fedora Core OS tracker that has the list of all the things that are going on on the Fedora side of the house for Core OS. Um, and I think that's all we've got today. So uh, we've yeah, got some questions in the chat. So Ben, do you want to? Yeah, actually, let me let me make a couple of points to kind of um, I'll, I'll kind of wrap this up, and then we'll we'll jump into these questions right around right away. I saw some good ones in there. Um, so I, I it's just the highest level. I want want everybody to understand that we we really want to change as little as possible with Container Linux. Again, it's a it's a it's an awesome you know it, it's like a seemingly perfect operating system. But we really want to change as little as possible. But the reality is that the ecosystem has changed a lot since that was first um, first created. So we're just adapting it, you know, for, for kind of lessons learned and kind of the, the direction and realities we have today in 2018. So, you know, our hope is that if you guys like Container Linux, you're going to love, um, you know, for example, Fedora Core OS, uh, where we really want to keep those use cases consistent. And, I mean, it should be almost a drop. Um, and then for anybody on the OpenShift side of the house, right? If you if you like Tecton, you should love OpenShift, right? Because the the experience of everything from how the cluster is provisioned to just this um, this uh, immutable lifestyle, I think is the right way to say that. Um, all of that is being brought in, and so the the entire cluster is just this this self driving model, right? Where we just we just we, we instantiate it and boom, it just, it's self care and being kind of, kind of methodology here. So that's, um, you know, that, that's kind of, kind of where our heads are at. So, um, yeah, Jeff, thank you for, for walking through that. Diane, I think I rudely interrupted you a second ago. So did you, did you have anything to, to jump on about? Yeah, um, I'm just saying, I love that immutable lifestyle, um, phrase. <laughs> We're going to have to use that in a few other places. There are a lot of questions in the uh, chat. So maybe we should just move into those and yeah. uh, see if we can get some of them answered. All right, Sach, and so uh, first one, is metering and chargeback gonna be available without cloud forms? And the answer is yes. So uh, Tectonic had this beautiful uh, administrative console that is moving into OpenShift. So, um, uh, and it, it does have RBAC on it, right? So if you're a developer, you'll still hit the, the current, um, or you know the, the, the OpenShift console we've had for a while that has a very good, um, just a task oriented uh, workflow for deploying applications that will be your default view um but if you're on the off side of the house you'll have this tectonic uh, console right that will show you uh kind of the health of the of the whole cluster in like that type of a bird's eye view um now that said uh cloud forms still has powerful capability and so you know that's not changing but yeah prometheus is, is there and running and, and tracking everything from the cluster so hopefully that answers that question by the way as i go through this list if i if i screw something up just uh i don't know feel free to ask another comment and i'll, I'll try to pick that up um, uh, okay so next one dennis uh we have kube control uh, yes kube control um so uh we always have uh oc which uh basically wraps uh, kube control and by the way the, that is the canonical pronunciation is kube control so please scold anybody who says kube cuddle is that's uh, technically incorrect from the guy who started it <laughs> i'm just kidding we would never scold people uh when in the open source world um but yeah uh so kube uh kube uh control is is there everything you expect is there um and again oc will, has all those commands so it's fully compatible it just adds a, a few more so there, yeah, all that all that works as expected. Um, I see a comment on Quay. Uh, that that is correct. Um, that the the uh, existing OpenShift registry um, you know carries on as as it has. Uh, we are looking at making Quay you know embedded in the in the in OpenShift as well as better integration with it living outside of OpenShift. Um, 
however, uh, that that's done by one of my peers, so I don't actually have the latest details on that. But um, but I, I can tell you there's there's work happening there. Um, I, I think I've got a little bit more detail. Um, oh, that would be great. So for I I don't know that our long term plans are exactly uh, concrete yet, but I believe for 4.0 um, the Docker registry is going to remain as the internal registry unless something really dramatic changes. Um, but for right now, Quay is still an external registry. Yes. Okay. Um... Yeah, so the next one is around vulnerability advising uh, on Tectonic. Uh, current open escape one is limited to image scanning. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. So um, obviously there's there's multiple scanners out there, right? Uh, open SCAP is is uh, helpful for identifying uh, CDEs content right where we where we have a scap stream for that um on the quay side you, you obviously have clear running and scanning images in the registry makes a heck of a lot of sense right since at runtime they should be obviously identical and the same um so i i don't have the best answer for that um again that that is run by the other people on the team so i i apologize um but I, I I can tell you that uh, Claire, uh, you know, Claire continues to be an investment point and, and isn't going away. So, um, you know, that that'll give us robust scanning on the registry. All right, Richard, I love this quote. Kubernetes is done. I, that would be a world record because I, I would think that would be the first piece of software to actually be complete. Um, <laughs> of course, uh, say that half in jest, but. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the a lot of the design probably could be considered as done, but I I, I would not consider uh, who complete by by any means. Uh, I think I think this is probably one of those things where who you talk to, you're going to get a different answer on, right? Just depending on their perspective and, and how close they are to the technology. Um, as far as having problems with updates, uh, these these problems kind of manifest themselves for different reasons, right? Um, sometimes it's uh, sometimes it's changes in in the core, but sometimes it's changes on on other other parts of the stack, right? Like a networking tier, or you know, for example, the part that Jeff and I work on all the time is the container runtime side of this. Um, all these projects in open source have their own cadence, their own life cycle, right? And so they don't always line up with, uh, with Kube. Uh, that's one of the big reasons we started the whole cryo project was we really wanted that runtime to iterate perfectly for the rest of the platform, right? So, um, anyway, I, I do think, uh, we're actually, we're, we're definitely closing the gaps on all the upgrade stuff. So when, and when V4 comes out, it, it's totally a game changer on that side of the house. So all of us are really excited about that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with Kubernetes is done. <laughs> um, next question, by the way, Jeff, feel free to hop on. Um, sure, yeah. do you want me to answer the 10 year support lifecycle question? Uh, oh, sure. Okay, so uh, no, Red Hat Core OS is not going to have a 10-year support lifecycle. It's going to be supported with OpenShift. So uh, as long as that OpenShift release is supported, Red Hat Core OS running that release will be supported, right? Um, I don't know uh, the current uh, support terms for every OpenShift release. Ben, do you know those? Um, well, we're... Where we want to go, um, so so no, I don't actually know that current thing, but I, I can give you guys some color on kind of where we want to go and take this. Is that um, Kube moves fast, right? It's it's basically a quarterly cadence. Um, and I remember uh, almost a year ago, KubeCon, one of Tim Hawkins' talks. He asked he asked a, a packed room, you know, how many people uh, want that cadence to slow to something like six months, and like every single hand in the room went up. Um, so that was interesting feedback that, of course, has not happened and hasn't hasn't been a change. But um, the, you know, what we, the work we're doing around upgrades and everything uh, is is really targeted to where customers can move from, you know, let's just say 
112 to 113 like effortlessly, right? It just it's one click. The nodes cycle through, boom, you're you're up and running, right? And it's it's a non-event. We really want this to work like your like your cell phone. Um and so so with all the effort and resources around this, uh getting to like the seamless updates, we, we really want them to be a non-factor uh for the environment. Sorry, Jeff, that probably wasn't exactly what you were looking for, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's see the next question uh, terraform instead of ansible to bootstrap um, I believe so I'm not sure that it's still terraform but I think uh, right now the installer work that we're working on in public is moving in that direction um, can, but that's for the red hat core os version not necessarily the bring your own host version um, we're still keeping some ansible around and we still have playbooks that will need to be run if you're running on rel and um, both paths are planning on being supported. Is that correct, Ben? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's not really one or the other. It's going to be both to a degree. Um, yeah, they they both have different niches and work well. So it's it's not like a, a one versus the other. It'll it'll be it'll be both a mix of both. Yeah. Yep. And yes, the update will also take care of the OS update as well. Um, that is the entire plan for kind of tying the. Um, the components that Kubernetes needs to the host, right? Okay, um, F5, great question. Um, yeah, that is so, um, well, I don't know if I dropped or Ben dropped, but um, the tighter integration of OpenShift with CoreOS, uh, how is that going to affect OpenShift with RHEL? Um, well, we're, we're going to support running the same things that uh, anything that can run on Red Hat Core OS should be able to run on RHEL as well. Um, that's just the baseline. RHEL is the place to run containers. Um, the, what Red Hat Core OS allows us to do is really uh, standardize what, what operating system we're running on and what are the capabilities that we're running on. And let us really uh, let that soar and make sure that we're able to uh, recreate exactly what's going on in a customer's cluster and uh, know with certainty what the capabilities of the node are, right? So um, it, it shouldn't uh, affect users too much. The, the same functionality and the same uh, features should be there. And the ability to customize things with RHEL will still exist but it may re require a little bit more uh, effort and work on the part of the uh, operator, right? Yeah, so, sorry, my mic dropped out. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, th we will always support kind of both paths. And I think, I think the question is, well, well, why would I want to do one or the other? Jeff just hit on a lot of that. Um, I, I'll, I'll just add that, you know, we, we work with a lot of customers that, um, you know, they have like a, a long certification process to get the OS in an environment. Maybe it's a regulated environment. Um, you know, again, maybe just all the value props of RHEL kind of define when you need to run that, right? Um, and so RHEL is always going to be a, a supported use case for everything. Red Core OS is just it, it's that it's the same RHEL experience automated with the platform, right? So um, it it's it's very opinionated by design because with that with that much uh you know strict of a, a form we can add a much higher degree of automation for that uh, with the general purpose operating system that just becomes you know difficult to impossible with the millions of you know combinations and configs out there that, that you know customers run so sorry that's long-winded but uh yeah both paths will be around um and for the Sachin, of their updates, uh, yeah, did Sachin have uh, Sachin oh, have a uh, question? I was just going to say thanks for plugging 311. Um, <laughs> yeah, go go ahead, Jeff. Take take next. Cool. Yeah, for over the air updates. Um, so what happens is uh, OpenShift works on an online first release model where um, we try and push it out to our own internal large clusters to uh, prove that it actually works before we make things GA. Uh, so we will be uh, definitely making them available internally and updating internally first to make sure that updates go well. 
before they're generally available. Um, I, I believe that we're still investigating uh, what would be the equivalent of the alpha beta stable streams of uh, container Linux, but um, I don't think that we've got anything in mind for subsets of uh, clients to be able to see things in advance yet. Is that correct, Ben? Yes. Okay. And uh, yes, immutable lifestyles, uh, great. I just trademarked that, Diane. So yeah, please make as many T-shirts as as you can. I'm um, I'm thinking that's just <laughs> slogan for CoreOS. Yeah, be wonderful. Yep. A couple more questions. Um, yep. In uh, Sachin, uh, is not that OpenShift on Rail will still remain an option. Uh, OpenShift on Rail will still remain an option. Yes, we we will still continue to support uh, installing OpenShift on Rail. That is uh, a big focus of ours. And yes, both paths are definitely very important to us. Um, any details about the integration with satellite? Um, yeah, I'll take, ben, I'll take that one. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, um, it, it's a little bit different, right? Um, on, on a rel side, you you register a system to satellite, right? And then at that point, it has visibility into the RPM database and like everything that comes out and pulls in repos, and you get these great diffs and blah blah blah. It makes it really super easy to see what all is updated on your systems and what 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 areas need attention. Um, Red Core OS does not have that registration step involved. So uh, integration with satellite is, is 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 almost by design not there uh, because we don't want we don't want the that part of the process to be involved in, in the cluster. We're we're very quickly moving to like the, the the world of auto scaling um, clusters both in the cloud and on prem um, and you know scaling up and scaling down uh, with registration becomes a you know a, almost a sticking point in some ways. Uh, now, how these things can work together is around the actual update streams themselves. Uh, you know, as we said, that all of the content for OpenShift is delivered via container images now, um, and and Satellite does a really great job mirroring container repos on prem, and so we see that as one of the biggest ways that Satellite um, will actually tie into the value. But it actually but it won't be that mechanism to actually go apply patches to the cluster, right? That is driven by an operator uh, in Kubernetes uh, in conjunction with some of the other some of the other tooling like Cincinnati and, and these other pieces. So, um, so it's it's a I'm gonna I'm gonna use an overloaded term. It's a very loosely coupled relationship between the two. Um, and yes, uh, feel free to use any screenshots from this. Um, that that would be. That's fine with me, yeah, because this is all this is all public stuff. Okay, next question I see, Sachin. By the way, thank you all for the good questions. This is awesome. Um, will there be a migration path for customers running OpenShift on RHEL to CoreOS? Um, we are not planning on flipping clusters over to CoreOS, um, and I, it, I'm not gonna say it, it's something that we. We can look at adding for the future, um, but it, it's not something that we're going to have right away. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear feedback if that's something that, that you guys would see value in. Um, I think with with the new model, the way uh, the way provisioning is 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 really kind of I don't want to say tightly coupled with the uh, the installer, but the installer plays a different role on installing uh, the the nodes and the clusters and, and just that whole process. Um, it, it's it's going to be better for most people to just start with a, a clean slate and then just, you know, move apps over, look into something like Arc or, or whatever to handle um, moving the moving the applications. But that that's pro primarily how people, when they want to switch that OS tier, how that's going to take place. Hopefully that helps. Um, okay, for on-prem, you can provide it. As an OBA, great question. We uh, we're we're going to have several. The long term, how we the the various ways we release um, Red Hat Core OS will look very similar to the formats we have available for Atomic Host today. So um, so like uh, you know for, for Atomic we've got you know an ISO, we have a QCow, BMBK, like all that stuff. 
all of these different platforms are going to get lit up for Red Hat Core OS. Um, we just can't do it all at once. So uh, we're really trying to nail a specific environment so that the end-to-end -end user experience is, is basically perfect, um, as close to perfect as we can make it, right? Um, so uh, right now, you, I think our primary one instead of an OVA is going to be a QCOW2, uh, and that'll, 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 we'll, we'll have that almost right off the bat. Hopefully, hopefully that'll fit that niche of the OVA. Um, master nodes are part of hosts we still be deployed as pods um, Jeff you might be able to handle that one better than me um, so it is a self-hosted plane but you yeah I'll, I'll stop the, talking the control <laughs> plane is definitely pods but um, the the kubelet is installed on the host so we're not going with containerized kubelet but I'm not sure if, if that answers the question I Think it does. Yeah. Um, what what I know is is um, so the control plane is all it's all done with static pods using the Kubelet, right? So that is set to run on boot. Um, but the Kubernetes Kubernetes binaries themselves are are not split out between client and and master. It's it's just, it's one binary basically. So you get that piece on the on on all of the nodes. I think that's right. Is that did I say that right, Jeff? Uh, that sounds right. That's that's why I'm kind of confused by the question. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Next one. Thank you for the uh, the comments. I like them. I won't lie. Okay. Uh, is there a migration path from 3.x on RHEL to OpenShift 4? Uh, yes. Uh, there absolutely will be a migration path. Um, it it is. Uh, it will be easiest if you're running like RHEL on a 3.x environment. Uh, we will be able to take you to RHEL on a 4.x environment. Um, that is no problem. If you want to get, and so, you know, that's basically, if you move that way, uh, you'll still manage and control the operating system like you always had with RHEL, uh, which is, you know, that's almost an advantage for many of our customers in their on-prem environments. So I think that's going to be a no friction path for, for a huge amount of our on-prem deployments. Um, if people want that full stack automation, so where the cluster is really controlling all the way down to the kernel, that's where you'll have to look at spinning up a new, a new cluster. So hopefully that, hopefully that makes sense. So we're getting close to the end of the hour here and um, just respect everybody's time and hopefully invite you guys back when you're closer to the uh, the beta release of CoreOS um, in the coming months. I won't pin you to a date today, um, but I will be posting this video up on our YouTube channel, RH OpenShift on YouTube, and along with the slides, which I'll ask you guys to email me or as a PDF or just send me the link. Um, and it was incredibly informative, so I can't thank you enough for sharing the vision and the, the details of, around this because it's always been, you know, it's been an interesting a road um, merging the two work, work paths together and, and making everybody happy. Um, but this has been um, great um, content for us, so um, I'm sure we'll get a lot of people um, emailing you questions and, and asking asking for more information as well as we get closer to the beta. So thanks, Jeff and Ben, um, and everybody for your amazing questions. Very good. And um, so much for yeah, well, thanks. Okay. There will be um, a 3.11 release, OpenShift Commons briefing coming up, I think, on the 18th of October. Um, the blog post on 3.11 is out today um, on bookhog.openshift.com. Um, so there's a little detail there to take up, take a look at, and um, we hope to see you soon back on another briefing um, at OpenShift Commons or at the upcoming gathering on December 10th in Seattle. If you're coming to KubeCon, please um, join us there the day before.